as we begin this morning, I want you to think about those three words you just saw on the screen. Exile. Second word was servant. The last word was prophet. All right, write those down maybe on your worship guide this morning. If you didn't get one and you'd like to take some notes, uh, just lift your hand while the guys in the back will uh, find you. Just slip your hand up. We'll get that to you. Those three words, exile, servant, prophet. Could you imagine being exiled, to be captured, to be uh, taken hostage, right? Uh, this would be uh, the worst nightmare for any of us or all of us. Then we think about this word servant. It didn't matter where Daniel was, he was going to be a servant to who? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to God. He was not going to let everything change in his life around him, but the, he, there were some things like last week we talked about, he did not let change. And then he was going to turn into this prophet. God was preparing him for what he had for him and what he wanted him to do. And a little bit of review this week of last week. Everything changed for Daniel, but nothing changed for Daniel. How many of you have something that's changing in your life this past seven days? Let me see your hand. Something has changed in the last seven days. Something has, right? There's change going on. Some of it big change, some of it medium, maybe small. But whatever it is, there's change going on. So when we look at our life, whether it's physical, whether it's um, uh, relational, maybe it's with a job situation, maybe um, it's in a different category, but you can say something is changing, but there are some things that Daniel said are not going to change. You remember what they were? Was man's favor. Any time that we purpose in our heart, right? Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. And when Daniel just decided that he was going to continue this step in his life of not defiling himself, to put himself where he needed to or appoint himself, when he decided to do that, who became uh, evident in his life with favor? Melzar. The very first step, we see the favor of Melzar. Do you remember that? And there's always going to be one. When we purpose in our heart, God is always going to supply one. Everybody say one. You're always going to see one that God will provide for you in the time when you've purposed in your heart and you've appointed your heart and your life to a certain thing to honor God with what you need to honor him with. You will find favor. We also said you're going to see lots of disapproval, but we all also looked at how we need to not focus on the disapproval and focus on the favor. Then there were three that we talked about also. God's power in our life. Is God's power in you? Say amen. That was a little weak, y'all. God's power in you. Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. We should be, yes, excited about that God's power is in us. And then God's perception was in Daniel. And then God's presence was always evident in Daniel's step by step in his life. And today we're going to look at a different part of Daniel, and that is this. Heaven rules over impossible situations. Heaven rules over impossible situations. When it seems totally impossible and there's, no, there's just no way in, in any sort and fashion that this could even come out good. An impossible situation. Heaven rules over that. Heaven rules over change. Heaven rules over culture. Uh, we talked about heaven rules because God is sovereign. God is never taken by surprise. And today, heaven rules over impossible situations. So the first question, what is your impossible situation? Pause for a minute. Think in your mind, what would I say today would be an impossible situation. It might be directly related to you. It might be an extension with friends or family. It might be something job-related. It could be a lot of different things. But I ask you to ask yourself, what is my impossible situation? For me, looking back, 14 years old, uh, an impossible situation, we'll call it this morning, I was totally amazed by this thing that my brother was uh, able to do, and he was able to whistle super duper loud, right? And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And he would take his fingers and he'd stick them in his mouth and somehow make his mouth be able to whistle like super loud. And I was like, man, that, he is my idol, you know? My brother, my older brother, two years, old, two years older than me, his name's Scott. He hates to leave the state of Florida. One day he might come visit us, I don't know. But... 
he could do that. I was like, that is impossible. I cannot even do that. I would try. I'd stick one finger, two fingers, three fingers. I'd do everything. I'd try no, no finger in the mouth to whistle. How many of you can do this with no, no fingers in the, mouth? You, you, in the mouth? You can whistle really loud. All right, on the count of three, I want to hear it. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, now how many of you have to stick fingers in your mouth to get this to come out? Is it a few of you? All right, you ready? You ready? Let's do it. Ready? Three. Count down with me because I can't do it with fingers in my mouth. Ready? Three. <laughs> Isn't that the coolest thing? Everybody say that's the coolest thing. I thought it was impossible. It's like, how can he do this? And I remember, I mean, for days, weeks, right? Weeks, sticking my fingers in my mouth. There wasn't YouTube back in this day, okay? So I was really having a struggle with this. And I remember finally getting the whistle to actually barely come out. And then it got better and better. And my brother hated it that I could do the same thing he could do. But at the time, for me, as silly as it may seem, I thought it was impossible. I'll never be able to do this. In our lives, there's going to be impossible situations. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter if you're married, not married. It doesn't matter if you're in high school or college or a young adult career person. It doesn't matter if you have one kid, two kids, six kids, uh, seven kids, however many you got, one, two. It doesn't matter. You're going to have impossible situations. And I remember in this discussion with my brother, and I would ask him before I learned how to do it, I would say, how do you do that? How, how do you do that? You know his favorite answer to me about a lot of things I couldn't do? And I want you to use this this week, all right? He would say two words. He would say very, everybody say very, carefully. So I maybe have told that story before, I don't know. But very carefully, and he was so sarcastic about it. But in our life with impossible situations, we are going to have to be very careful with how we deal with them because we're going to look at today how Daniel dealt with impossible situations. The heavens do rule. I want to remind you of that. The heavens do rule. Uh, Daniel 4.26, a very small phrase. Can you say it with me this morning? Heavens do rule. Can you say it with me? The heavens do rule. And I, I don't know what situation or what has happened in the last weeks that you've had to use this or what will happen in the next weeks to come that you can say the heavens do rule, just like they did for Daniel. How did how Daniel dealt with impossible situations. This is where I want to go this morning. How did Daniel deal with these impossible situations? Let's look at Daniel's situation for just a minute. What was Daniel's in, in, impossible situation? And how are we to deal with our impossible situations? A little background on the story, what's going on. Daniel here is still a young man uh, in his second year of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's reign, so he's still very young, probably not even 20 years old yet. Here we have King Nebuchadnezzar, who has created the impossible situations. Don't you love it when someone else creates your impossible situation, right? You're like, this is not good. Someone else has created this impossible situation, it seems. It is actually a life and death situation, so it's very serious to the highest degree. Maybe yours wouldn't be a life or death situation, but it is very serious to you. When everything around you has been majorly shifting one way or another, and life has now this uh, drastic, become drastically different in this impossible situation, how did Daniel deal with his? So again, I ask you this morning, name your impossible situation. Because until we name that impossible situation, we will not see the need of how to deal with that impossible situation. So let's look at Daniel chapter 2. Turn there with me, tap there, whichever you're using, your phone. Or, and I would encourage you, if you're using your phone, please put it on airplane mode. That's the uh, communication between the sky and the earth, right? Uh, go ahead and put that on so you don't get distracted this morning uh, in your phones. But I want you to focus in with me how Daniel dealt with impossible situations. How did he do it, and how can we do it? Chapter 2, verse 14. I want to look at just verse 13 briefly to kind of catch you up what's happening here. Nebuchadnezzar has the dream, the impossible situation is he's going to uh, kill all of the uh, magicians and the, the, those that, who can 
interpret dreams. He's going to kill all of this leadership. In verse 13, and the decree went forth that the wise men should all be slain, right? And they sought Daniel and his fellows, the three men that stood with him, and they were all going to be slain. In verse 14, then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which had gone forth to do what? To slay the wise men of Babylon. The word all is not in there, but that is who they're going for, every single one of them. So this impossible situation. The first thing Daniel did in dealing with impossible situations is this. He maintained balance. He maintained balance. The word balance means this. An even distribution of weight. I'll get it out. An even distribution of weight could be your mind or heart, could be actually something physical, but the distribution of weight enabling someone or something to remain upright and steady, to maintain balance. Daniel maintained balance. He did not panic. Tell your neighbor, do not panic. We've reviewed some of this in the past, but I want to recognize it again this morning. We do not have to panic. We can have balance in our life. To panic means to suddenly be overcome or uncontrollably in fear. Daniel did not just think about the situation only, the impossible situation, but he was looking to God for solutions in this situation. He maintained this balance. You could even say this in a note and underneath this point is this, is that he discreetly dealt with the situation. Let's talk about this word discreetly. It means this, in a careful and prudent manner. And it also means this. I, I love this because it is so pliable to us. For us to discreetly deal with an impossible situation, it is acting with or showing care with thought for the future. Let me say it again. It's acting with or showing care with thought for the future. How many of us have made decisions recently in a possible situation and we've only dealt with that situation or acted on that situation with what has to happen right now, not thinking of the future? Can you confess with me? We've all been there. We all can relate to that. So he was very careful not to do that. He discreetly, meaning carefully and prudently, he would act with or show care for, with the situation and for the future. He did not overreact. Just as my brother told me, do it what? Very carefully. So today, as we look at our impossible situations, maintain balance, realizing that God wants us to be very careful to do this, to maintain balance. The second thing, verse 15. And he answered and said to Arioch, the, cap, the king's captain. What's the very next word? I, I mean, I'm just asking, can you tell me the next word? I, really, just tell me the next word. What is it? Oh, yeah, why? Sorry. That was a joke, just so you're catching on. Why? The best question, right? A toddler loves to ask, right? How many of you love to ask the question why when you were little? You just loved it. All of us did. How many of you love it when your kids just nonstop? Well, you know, the first favorite question is why. And you know what the second one is? But why? You know, they always follow it up with why and then but why. Here's what I want you to see in this verse right here is that he answered and said to Arioch, this is the king's captain, this is the guy who is the person who, is going to, who has the ability and the strength to slaughter anyone he chooses to by the king's uh, power given to him. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is this decree so hasty from the king? And then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. The second thing that Daniel did in his impossible situation is he asked the right question. He asked the right question, and a lot of times, we can sometimes, a lot of times, ask the wrong question. He asked the right questions. They, you know that they say when you go into the doctor's office, it is a rule for a doctor, and maybe you can test them out on this, and if they're trying to diagnose what's going on in your life, they should ask you at least 21 questions. Why? Why 21? Because there's always and could be another question asked so they properly diagnose what your problem is. Are you with me? Say amen. And so when you get to 
to question 10, 15, 20. It's for you to, to understand what is going on in that situation. And so he asked the right question. Why did he do this? He asked, Daniel asked, because he wanted clarity. He wanted clarity of, of what the impossible situation was. We often react and respond to our situation without understanding. Have you been there? Say, come on. I've been there. I, I think I understand this situation. I make a response, and it's the wrong response because I did not understand the situation, and which causes, obviously, a, a whole nother situation. So the question, who, what, when, how? But Daniel skips all of those and goes right to the why. Maybe he thought he would only get one question in. I'm not sure. But he did ask the right question. Why is there so much hurry? Why is the king so hasty? How many of you have found yourself making an impossible situation even worse when you got into a hurry? Man, all the time. God, help me not to get in a hurry. And he asked, why is, it, why is the king so hasty? As we reflected on last week, God is going to reveal to us the why. And Daniel was looking in this impossible situation by asking the right question. The third thing is this, verse 16, the very first part of this verse says, Then Daniel went in and desired of the king. Who did Daniel go and see? He went to go see the king. So in his impossible situation, he went before the king. He went to the right source, we could say. He went to the king. He went to the right source. He desired of the king. He wanted to know from the king. He went to the proper source. Notice in this, he, Daniel had a lot he could have complained about. How many of you got any complaints? I got some complaints. I know you're not being honest. Everybody say, I got some complaints. You know, if I, if I was to talk to God, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, I would have a few complaints. Or maybe there's a certain person that you'd have certain complaints with or about. Daniel did not go to complain to the king. That was not his intent for going there. He did go to the proper source. A lot of times we didn't go to the right source, and a lot of times we go to the wrong source, and we go with complaining. Here we see Daniel going to the right source, and he's not going there for complaining, but he's going there for a couple different reasons. Daniel, first of all, knew who he was in God. Daniel knew who he was in God, and he went there because of what was happening, because he had clarity of the situation from Arioch, and now he wants a little more clarification from the king. So in his impossible situation, he didn't just ask the right question, and he didn't just keep balance, but he went to the right source. He went to the king. And notice here that he is not timid or intimidated by the king or Arioch. Everybody say, I have no reason to be intimidated. You have no reason to be intimidated by your culture. You have no reason to be intimidated by telling someone why you won't drink and why you won't eat certain things and why you won't do certain things because you have purposed in your heart not, in your heart not to defile yourself. Say, I'm not going to defile myself. You do what you want, but I'm not going to do that. Can somebody say amen? amen? In our life, there are certain things we don't have to do. And there's things that we should do. And I notice here that Daniel went to the king. He went to the right source. He didn't complain. He knew who he was. He was not intimidated. He was not timid. And we see here that Daniel is always about God's name, not his name. That is why he was not timid, because he went to the king in the name of God, not in the name of Daniel. I also can see that in other Old Testament uh, characters that we read about. But you can see here that Daniel was not intimidated or timid. So he went to the king. He went to the right source. The fourth thing is this. In the last part of 16, he desired of the king that he would give him, what's the next word? That he would give him, verse 16, let's start from the beginning. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time. 
our most precious thing that we have in life is time. The king was hasty and in a hurry with getting this interpretation. He's caused this impossible situation. And Daniel knows, he knows what to ask because he has clarity of the impossible situation. Do you notice that? He knows what he needs to ask because he has clarity of the impossible situation. He understands and so he says, King, I need to have time. And then look what he says, that he would show the king the interpretation. It did not say that he might show the king the interpretation, but he said that he would show the king the interpretation. Notice, as we talked about last week, any times there, there is a need of change, there is also a need of faith. Can you say amen? Anytime there's a, a place of movement or change in your life, it's going to take faith. Will I have the courage to use my faith? So number four, he allowed time for God. In the impossible situation, Daniel says, I'm going to allow Time for God. Daniel was not using this as a stalling tactic because things were impossible. He was not stalling here. We don't have to stall. Daniel didn't expect a quick fix. Everybody say, I don't need a quick fix. A lot of times in our heads, that's what we're thinking, but we do not need a quick fix was not looking for a quick fix here. He didn't take a guess at the interpretation. Notice that. He didn't say, well, I'll just guess at it. Hopefully I get close. He wasn't looking for the quick fix or to guess at the the solution. He allowed time for God. Notice here that Daniel did not put God on a timeline. If you've been guilty of that, put both hands up. Man, I've been guilty of that. I put God on a timeline. I say, God, I'm going to give you 24 hours. How's that sound, God? Can you do that? How about 48 or 72? 72 is my limit, God. I need an answer in 72 hours. Man, we've all been guilty of that. But notice, Daniel does not put a timeline on his answer from God. He knew it was going to take time. Listen, he knew it was going to take time to listen and wait on God. The same thing that he requested from the king, he knew he was going to have to apply in his own life with God. The very thing he asked the king of, he was going to have to use in his own relation with God and say, God, I'm here to listen, I'm here to wait, and I'm here to spend my time with you to reveal to me what it is we need to do. Daniel, in this this particular verse, did not know how quick the answer was coming. He did not give God a timeline but he was willing to allow God time to come through. All of us, again, can say there's been times that I acted without waiting and listening on God, giving him more time to come through. So then I made the impossible situation a little bit worse, but then maybe I finally decided to take a step back and let God come through, and then he does. But many times, this is where we play this game of allowing God time or not allowing God time. And Daniel maintained confidence that God would reveal himself. Just as we said, anytime there's a waiting for change, there's also an act of faith. So the fourth thing is he allowed time for God. Look at verse 17 and 18. Then Daniel went to his house, And made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. What's the next two words? His companions. Those that were closest to him. The meaning of those three names, Yahweh is my helper. I am basically a reflection of who God is. And Yahweh is gracious. In your time of need, God will be gracious. In your time of need, God will be your helper. In your time of need, you can reflect who God is. And these three men, are are, Daniel comes to them, his companion, and he makes this thing known. So the fourth thing is, or excuse me, the fifth thing is that 
He shared his burden or he shared the burden. A lot of times we'll skip one of these seven things we're going to talk about. And it's, it's actually an accumulation of all seven of these things that help us in our impossible situation. And many times we want to skip one or two, or we want to just do the first one and try to maintain balance, and that's all we do. But here we see very clearly that Daniel shared the burden. He had good, God-centered friends. The core friendships of his life he could count on. Can I remind us all this morning that those core relationships, the reason why as a pastor that I feel that God has led us to have two opportunities for small group on Sunday night and Wednesday night is because all of the different work schedules that you keep, all the different shifts that you're on. I know that if you don't have good core God-centered friends, it is going to hurt you in your walk with God and it's going to hurt you in your culture. Can you say amen? You may not see that big picture like I can see that, but if I don't have and we don't have an opportunity for Sunday nights for you to have core God-centered friends in Bible fellowship or the opportunity on Wednesday night to have small group where you are being fed and you can have these friendships, we're doing a disservice to us as a body of believers. Can you say amen? I want you to realize the vision of this. I want you to realize the, the, the rotation of our week. Every week we are meeting the seven needs that I feel like and the leadership of the church feels like is needed for us to be healthy, to be a healthy church, to be healthy spiritually. Yes, I want you to be physically healthy, but I want you to be spiritually healthy. And I, only, I know the only reason and the only way that can happen is if we have these core friendships to share the burden, to share whatever that impossible situation is. Daniel had good God-centered friends to do this. It didn't look like a prayer assembly. I know there's several of you who meet every Sunday. It could be at 9.55. It could be at 9.40. It could be at 9.45. That prayer assembly is open from 9.30 to 5. 9.30 to 5. 9.30 to 10. That was kind of funny. Sorry, y'all. 9.30, not to 5, but to 10. And that's a place where you can go and you can share that burden on a Sunday morning and say, hey, let's pray about this impossible situation. Let's pray about this person and you're, that's a friend of yours that needs this, or this is going on, or they don't know Christ, or whatever the situation is, we can come and pray and share that burden. Bible Fellowship, Wednesday night, I encourage you. I know you can't make every Wednesday night. I know you can't make every Sunday night. I'm not saying you're unholy if you don't. Did you hear me? I said you're not unholy if you don't. Say amen. It's your perfect opportunity. Say amen. I want you to know that it's there for you. It's an invitation to you. It's not an obligation to you. It's an invitation to you to say, okay, I need good, God-centered people in my life to share the burdens of life. And if you can make a couple Sunday nights because of your schedule, you can make a couple Wednesday nights, or you can say, hey, I can make every Wednesday night. I can make every Sunday night. Whatever the case is, Bible fellowship, Wednesday night small group, our youth. The only way that we're going to reach our youth is if we enable them, because not all of them drive, is we enable them to bring their friends just fifth quarter on Friday night, we had around 70 students. Is that right? Around 70 students after a football game on Friday night show up here at the church for a time of fun, yes, but a time of reflection of what God has to say in their life. And on, on a Sunday night, it's the same thing that can happen at 5 o'clock, but as adults, as families, let's, let's, let's pick a night and say, let's, you know, we may not be able to make every Sunday night. We may not be able to make every Wednesday night. But I, am, I have this invitation to have these core God-centered friends. I want that in my life. Because in order for you to be a healthy believer in Christ, this is what we need in impossible situations. So they shared the burden. There's a quote that I have this morning. I'm not sure of the author of this, but I want to share it with you. When we face impossible situations and keep all of our emotions and fears internalized and bottled up, it will consume our hearts. Everybody say, consume our hearts. It will consume your heart and my heart and eventually disrupt our peace. And so this morning, share the burden. Have God-centered friends to share that burden with. And then along this line with friendship is Daniel cultivated 
those friendships. Make a note this morning underneath, underneath there. Daniel cultivated these friendships. I want to share with you what this word means. Cultivate means to rise or to raise or grow, to develop or to improve. So in order for us to improve one another, in order for us to develop and grow one another, to to raise each other up, we need to cultivate these friendships, and that's where it happens. It happens here, yes, on Sunday morning in our worship and our time in in the Word as collectively as a whole church body. Yes, it happens, but it also happens in a deeper way in these places of sharing your burden. I want us to notice that Daniel here Look at it one more time. He made known, verse 17, he made known known these things to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. And then look what it says. That they would desire mercies of God of heaven, of the God of heaven concerning this secret or concerning this impossible secret situation. And Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. I want you to maybe underline the word mercies there. And when you study that word mercies out, you're going to find another word that reflects there is this word passion. Daniel prayed with passion with his friends. He was not this robotic prayer God, we're in an awful situation. You know my request of 72 hours. Look forward to hearing from you soon. That was not Daniel's prayer. That was not their prayer. But they were asking for the mercies of God. They were asking with compassion for this request. So they shared their burden. They allowed time for God. They went before the right source, the king. They asked the right questions. They maintained balance. And then this next one, in verse 19. Then was the secret, the impossible situation was revealed unto Daniel in the night vision. Daniel slept with God's peace. Don't you love a good night's rest of peace? There's a lot of things that try to take our peace. But here Daniel and these guys, they're in this moment. It is a life or death situation, and they go to sleep. How and why could they sleep? What happened right before this? They prayed robotically. Is that what it said? So they prayed with passion or for mercies of God. Anytime you pray with passion or the mercies of God, a result of that is going to be what? Anytime you realize the heavens do rule, and in an impossible situation, I can follow the pattern of Daniel and this accumulation of these seven things, and I can do that same thing passion, and then I can sleep with God's peace? Yes. Daniel can rest on the eve of this death decree. Daniel relied on God with faith and trust in him alone. Daniel did not allow his thoughts, you are going to have thoughts, but Daniel did not allow his thoughts to disrupt or distress or clog up his own peace of mind that God was giving to him. He slept and rested. We can sleep and rest in God's peace once that passion has been shared. The end of 19 says this, Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel paused to praise. I want you to notice how long this pause is. He did not rush. Daniel did not rush to give the revelation or the answer. He paused long enough to realize that he was not the one that found the answer. 
He was the receiver of the answer. And he did not rush to, rush to give that revelation. A scholar, David Atkins, says this, the interpretation of the dream was important. Everybody say it's important. But knowing and worshiping God was ultimate. What is important to you and what is ultimate to you? You decide. So he paused to praise. I want us to notice that the words recorded from Daniel and his conversation with God are much longer than his conversation with either the king or um, Ariok. The conversation and record of conversation that we have is much longer in his praise to God. And I want us to notice a couple things that, about it as we come close to our, our finish this morning, our time of response is this. Is that out of these seven things, what would you say, that is what I'm skipping? That is what I'm missing. In your impossible situation, are you, are you doing these steps that we've talked about, this accumulation of what Daniel did? Because I want us to see, as we continue reading from 20 to 23, look at these words of Daniel. And, and let me just say this right now. There's a verse in here that you very well need to claim this week. That is going to be my declaration. We talked about Daniel's declarations, talking about taking truth to declare over your life. And it's very possible that you need to take one of these next three verses and make it your declaration for your impossible situation. Notice what he says. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the God, the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and I'm going to add in here, because and with an impossible situation. He changed the times and the seasons of this impossible situation. He removed kings and the setting up of kings in this impossible situation. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding in this impossible situation. He revealeth the deep and secret things of this impossible situation. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of, our, of my fathers, in this impossible situation who has given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now what, what's the next word? We desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Daniel kept God his all-time ultimate priority. When you read the word blessed, in verse 20, it actually means to kneel in prayer or to kneel in praise. Can I, can I ask us all this week, I'm not going to ask how we did last week, because I know we all would say we need to improve, but I, can I encourage you this week, kneel in prayer? Can I encourage you this week to kneel in praise? Three minutes, get your favorite praise song and just go to your knees. You don't have to lift your hands. You don't have to put a smile on your face. Uh, that was a joke. Uh, but you can kneel and bless the name of God in praise. It does something for the internal health of our spiritual walk to kneel before God. To say, God, I'm here to praise you. God, I'm, I'm here to request something of you. God, I'm here with my impossible situation. God, I'm not putting you on a timeline. And God, I want you to know that I know that you have the answer. I want you to know, God, that I know that I'm nothing, but I am in desperate need of who you are. And we say, God, I want to bless you this morning. I want to kneel in prayer and praise in verse 21, he uses the word changeth, to alter or transform. Do you need an impossible situation altered or transformed? He removeth. He means he takes away to remove. Do you need God to remove or take away an impossible situation? He setteth up to establish, to endure, or to lift. You need him to, to move in an impossible situation. To giveth means to provide or to pay. What is it that God wants to do with your impossible situation? In verse 23, to thank and to praise means to adore 
excessively. To adore means to praise excessively. God, I want to kneel and I want to bless your name even though I'm in an impossible situation. I know you will deliver in your time. God, I come to you with thank and praise and I adore you excessively. We or us together with my core friends, we bring this impossible situation to you. Desiring, meaning to ask, to seek, to request, to be made known is to inform and to reveal. So this morning, the answer we want, please don't leave me yet, stay with me. The answer we want is not the priority. The answer Matt Burns wants is not the priority, but to praise God for the answer that I get, even if it's not the answer I want. God, whatever your answer is, that is the answer I want. I don't want you to give me what I want. God, I want you to give me what you want. And it's this place of surrender. God will not leave you and will not leave me without revelation in our impossible situations. So here it is. Listen to me. Look at me this morning. To receive God's revelation in your impossible situation, you must follow Daniel's accumulation. What am I talking about in this accumulation? I'm talking about maintaining balance, asking the right question. He would go to the right source. He would allow God time. He would share the burden. He would sleep with God's peace, and he would pause to praise. This morning, in order for us to receive God's revelation, we have to follow Daniel's accumulation of the process of this impossible situation. Would you bow in prayer with me this morning? I'm not going to say a whole lot in this time of response. I would ask you right now, would you just step out with your impossible situation? Would you step out right now, grab someone's hand and just say, hey, this is a private moment. This is a place where we can go bless God's name. We can pray together. Who's that core person that you would say, hey, let's just go pray about this impossible situation. Maybe it's an impossible situation with a friend. Maybe it's a job situation. Maybe it's a relationship situation. Would you just grab their hand and say, let's go pray about this. What would it be this morning? Maybe it's a, a husband wife you need to be drawn closer together. Maybe you feel like you're being pulled apart with your schedule. Maybe you say, hey, let's go pray about us this morning. Maybe it's about a son or a daughter who's in an impossible situation, it seems. Would you take advantage of this time, a private moment, pray with someone there in your seat, come to a place of the altar this morning, place of our surrender together. I ask you this morning again, what part of Daniel's accumulation are you missing? Are you maintaining balance? Are you asking the right questions? Are you going to the right source? Are you allowing time and taking time for God? Are you sharing the burden? Are you sleeping with God's peace? And are you pausing to praise this morning?